And so turn there in your Bible. The guys in the back don't have my notes. So, because I don't want them to know what I'm going to say. So, that's not true. But, uh, so don't depend upon the screen. Use your Bible. Hebrews 12, Ephesians, uh, Hebrews 12 and James 4. We're going to read Hebrews 12, verse 1 through 16 again. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not so much more be subject to the fathers of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal." We started into this passage, and uh, my whole purpose of getting to this passage is so that I could preach verse 15, which says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and that by it many become defiled. That's where I want to get to, and so we had a long time getting there. Uh, because we do this thing at Calvary Baptist Church that when you preach a passage, you try to keep it in context, right? It's a good, it's a good habit, and so we've been establishing the context All of this to help us to understand what types of relationship we're to have with one another so that we can see the church built up, right? This is the idea. What does a mature church look like and how do we attain or accomplish uh, the building up of a mature body of believers? And this passage uh, helps us to see that. And so this is our third week in it, and we're not going to focus primarily on Hebrews 12. We're going to ultimately be in, in James chapter 4. But these two things are related, as we will see. And so we said that the writer of Hebrews is encouraging his recipients. He says to them, hey, uh, you need to endure in the faith. Uh, your faith is an enduring, persevering faith, uh, regardless of the struggles that you're facing, whether the personal internal struggles or whether they are the pressures of persecution or the stigma that confessing Christ brings upon you. Uh, there is no turning from the faith back to the old system. You can't go back to Judaism. You can't reject Jesus Christ because there's nothing outside of Christ. And so once you've come to receive that knowledge, uh, if you go back, there's no more knowledge for you. There's no other special revelation you're going to receive. There's no other way of salvation that you're going to encounter. This is it. It's Jesus Christ, the supreme and final sacrifice for sins, and that's it. And uh, so if you turn from that, there is no salvation for you. That's the idea. And so you're feeling pressure, uh, persecution, suffering. Don't turn back. You must persevere. Your faith must endure. And so the writer of Hebrews gives them some encouragements. Hebrews chapter 11, this whole hall of faith, all these men and women of faith who uh, made it to the end of their lives, persevering and enduring, fighting that uh, fight of faith. And the uh, list there have those who have had tremendous victories of faith and those who also suffered tremendously because of their faith. 
But the common strain throughout all of them is that their faith endured. And so the writer of Hebrews says, consider the suffering of the saints that have gone on before you and then take courage, endure. And then he says, consider Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Uh, And so he suffered. Why? Because he understood resurrection, uh, exaltation existed on the other side of the cross. And so he endured the cross. And then the writer of Hebrews says, and remember that when you suffer, you're also suffering as children of God. And so, so don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord and so on. Uh, you are being treated as his children. And so he gives those three encouragements. Okay, And then he says, therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and so on. And I say we're going to look at three, uh, a three-point outline. We're going to say, on the basis of those encouragements, that encouragement to endure in your faith, don't fall away, don't fall back, don't backslide, don't, don't uh, forsake Christ, don't turn to the world... Uh, Uh, do these three things. And he says, strengthen. Strengthen your weak knees. Lift up your drooping hands. Strengthen your weak knees. In other words, get get yourself together. Get yourself together. You've been under the circumstances here, under the suffering, and you are about to fail. And he says, strengthen yourself based upon the theological encouragements I've given you. Okay? So strengthen yourself. We saw strengthen. Last week we saw strive in verse 14. Strengthen yourself and get to work, right? Get yourself together, carve out a path, know where you're going, set a path for yourself, and lead others, right? So that what is lame is not put out of joint. That is, don't allow your discouragement and your unfaithfulness to affect others because there's some that are weaker than you. And when you kind of trip up, those who are weaker than you may actually fall away from the faith as a result. And so uh, get it together, set your path, be faithful, be consistent. Verse 14, strive for peace. And so last week we saw how essential it is to be a peacemaker. To be a peacemaker. Oftentimes under the strain of suffering, under the strain of trials, that's where we have personal struggle. And during those personal struggles then we can see our relationship strained. Our spiritual guard is down. And instead of being the peacemaker, we become those who bring about conflict. And so we saw that last last week. Next week, we're going to move on to see verse 15, where it says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. And we're going to look at that under the heading of oversee. Now, for today, I want to back up a little bit to verse 1 of Hebrews 12. Verse 1 of Hebrews 12. We said that no matter what you're going through, your faith must endure. In fact, you've been given a faith that can endure. That's the encouragement. Okay, That's Hebrews 11. You've been given a faith that can endure. No matter what you're encountering in life, your faith can endure. You can make it to the end, persevere to the end, be found blameless before Christ. Okay, That is our faith. So get it together. Now, Lift up your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, and carve out your path. Right? We said that. But what must we do if we're going to strengthen ourselves and say, hey, I'm going to make it. I'm going to set with determination my mind. I know the path I'm going to take. I want to serve Christ. I want to love Him. I want to be faithful and consistent. I want to persevere in the faith. and I want to bring others along with me. Right? That's my path. Something you've got to do if you're going to succeed uh, down that path, and that's in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, don't be confused, but it's just saying, based upon everything we just saw in, in, in chapter 11, that list of men and women who have succeeded in the faith, on the basis of the encouragement we receive from their examples, then do what? Lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You've got to lay aside every weight, the sin which clings so closely. He's saying there are sins or sin in your life which easily entangles you and so it keeps you from running the race of faith. That's the idea. And so whereas we said you need to carve out a path and set your your mind and be determined and you're going to be faithful to Christ, we said that, there are some things that are going to hinder you from that. Personal things. There's a weight of sin that seems to entangle you personally and me personally. And for each of us, it may be different. So the writer of Hebrews says, you got to lay it aside. Every weight and sin which clings so closely. 
Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. There's something in your life or some tendency in your life that seems to ensnare or entangle you. You got to take care of it. You can't perpetually be that person that's always brought down by the same continual inclinations or sin that keeps you from persevering in the faith. You got to lay it aside. And the encouragement there is you can lay it aside. He just says so, so plainly, let us lay aside every weight and sin, which clings so closely. And you say, if it was only that easy. The reality is, you have everything you need. And so I want to look at Hebrew, uh, James chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, because what we're going to see, you say there's sin in your life, there's something that entangles you, something that you struggle with continually, and you're like, where is this coming from? Why do I always struggle with this? Why can't I make spiritual progress? Why am I always treading water? We talk about this victorious Christian life and running the race and carving out the path and bringing others along with me and making sure I'm not a stumbling block to them. And I I can't even be consistent in my personal spiritual walk. What's the source of those things which seem to hold you back, to tie you up, to entangle you? James chapter 4 has the answer. James chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. It says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Last week we said, strive for peace. You want to endure in the Christian walk. You want to bring others along with you. You want to see their spiritual success. You don't want to be a stumbling block for them. So... Strive for peace. And here in James it says, but there's quarrels and fights. Where does that come from? What are the peace killers, we could say? And James says, what causes the quarrels? What breaks the peace? What causes fights? It's this. Passions that are at war within you. There's conflict. Conflict's not the source of everything around you. That's what we always seem to tell ourselves, though, right? I mean, I could succeed and I could have peace with others and and we could have harmonious relationships if only everybody around me would behave exactly the way I want them to. And we put the blame on everything external. James says, let me tell you where, where the problems are coming from. It's on the inside. As soon as James says it's within you, he says it's within. It's in us. And it's in you. It's personal. And so he contradicts us. We're so determined that if my circumstances were different or the people around me were different, then uh, I could have peace. I wouldn't have this struggle. James says the opposite. It's you. And so this is what James wants us to do. Every individual then takes to heart and says, it's me. The problem is me. No matter what situation you're in, You're the problem, right? This is what he's saying. Now, think about this. You say, well, I don't think that's just. I mean, because there's people in my life that clearly are the aggressor and clearly are the wrong ones. Okay, and I'm going to grant you that. But what I'm going to say to you is your reaction to that circumstance or to that person entirely falls within your purview and in your heart. And so what is the cause of quarrels? What are the cause of fights? We could say there's jerks. There's sinners who are causing all kinds of conflict, okay. But it's up to us as to how we respond to the situation, circumstances, and people around us. And so last week we saw there is a way to respond. You can be a peacemaker. To the extent that there are quarrels and conflicts among us and that our passions are inflamed is the extent to which we're not controlling our own hearts. And so... As far as believers are concerned, you know, James is writing, this is an early epistle. It's really the ethical implications of Jesus' oral teachings. Uh, This is the Lord's brother, half-brother. He's writing this uh, very, very early. 
He's not basing it upon other New Testament writings. This is the ethical implications of the oral teachings of Jesus. And so uh, James is writing to us saying, Jesus wants you unified. He wants peace among you. We know that Christ taught that the love that we have for one another is going to be the evidence that we're his disciples. James 13, I'm sorry, John 13, 35. We know that Jesus prayed that we would be one uh, in John 17. And so James here is saying, okay, Christ prioritizes love and unity and peace. And so James is giving us ethical implications and instruction to how to maintain that peace. And so he wants it to be abundantly clear. Your struggles are internal. Your struggles are internal. What causes the conflicts? What are the peace destroyers? Or whatever's emanating from your heart. And so, verse 1 through 3. Now, let me back up a little bit. This is essential for us to get down. Because we're going to come back to Hebrews chapter 12, eventually. And we're going to get to verse 15. And verse 15 says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Okay. Question, for those of you who have been in church for any matter of time. Have you ever witnessed somebody for some span of time who seemed to be growing in the faith and seemed to be an integral part of the church and seemed to be doing just fine, and then eventually saw something develop in them, whether it be unforgiveness, animosity, resentment, um, uh, bitterness, you began to see that develop and to grow. To grow and to grow and to grow to the point where it would overflow and even then impact others. Have you witnessed that pattern? I've been around church long enough that not only have I witnessed it happen, but I've identified the pattern and can almost predict it before it happens as I observe the lives of others. There's a real danger. And so the writer of Hebrews says, get yourself together Lay aside the sin that holds you back. And eventually he's going to say, because you've got a job to do, you need to make sure that those internal conflicts of yours don't overflow to become a hindrance to others so that then others then develop a root of bitterness that causes divisions and ultimately springs up, causes trouble, and through it many are defiled. So we've got to get our act together. Understand that we have internal conflict. There are idols of the heart that we have set up. And our pursuit of those idols in our heart causes conflict. If we don't get that right, we have the danger of offending others to the point then where we can see a root of bitterness spring up, defiling many. So, James 4, 1 through 3. says, there's an internal source for conflicts. There's an internal source for for our sinful shortcomings. These are the heart causes of conflict. And so he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? That's external. It's not this. This is your passions that are within you. So get that straight. External conflict is caused by internal conflict, as we'll see. And he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? The idea there... The word for war has the idea of entrenched, battling desires. These are those things that are at war, that want prominence, that want to consume your mind. I mean, these are those driving impulses and driving passions that say, I want all of your attention, I want all of your love, Uh, I, I want you to pursue me above everything else. It's those passions. It says, your passions are at war within you. Now, could you relate to this? Have you experienced that internal war? On one side you say, I want to serve God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. That's what I want to do. I want to glorify Him. I want to serve Christ. I want Him to be my first love. Above all else, I want that. And you can say that with all honesty and all sincerity. But then at the same time, there's other passions, aren't there? And those passions go to war against those primary passions. And you experience that battle inside of you. And I experience that battle inside of me. These are the passions that are at war. And these are the source. 
of conflicts. And these are the source or those things which entangle us so that we can't run the enduring race of faith. 1 Peter 2.11 Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. There's a battle raging on the inside of you and on the inside of me. We need to be aware of it so that we can lay aside these things which cling so closely to us and hold us back so that we can't run with endurance the race that's set before us. These are lusts, patterns of thinking, those things which have a tendency to ensnare us or to distract us, to render us unable to run the race of faith effectively. And it, it, there's some things that are common to all of us and there's other things that are not. So stop for a second. What is it that you know is a personal struggle for you that ensnares you? What is a dominant lust or passion inside of you that goes goes to war against your desire to serve Christ? What is it that seems to sidetrack you, to, to tangle you up so that you cannot live a life of faith? That's what you need to focus on. Because the writer of Hebrews says you need to lay it aside. You can't lay it aside unless you can identify it. And so we find a source of of conflict. We're not just talking about interpersonal relational conflict. I'm talking also about conflict inside of us. What causes these things? Well, the entrenched battling desires. That's verse 1 of James 4. But then in verse 2, he says, You desire and you do not have, so you murder. Okay, so there's internal conflict that's just at war within my heart. This is what I want to do. And this is like Paul in Romans 7, right? This is what I want to do. But this is what I end up doing. And he says that he sees this this law, right? In his life. He's really iterating what we see here. There's a battle inside of me. So so we have that happening. But then in verse 2, it says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. He's saying, when those passions that are at war with inside of you are not... Uh, uh, satisfied. That's then when it overflows into conflict. And so we've talked in instruments the idea that there's some things in your life that you've elevated to a position of idol. This, This is my passion, my desire. I want this. And all of life is seen through the lens as to whether or not I'm getting that thing or not getting that thing. And so, how I view myself, and how I view um, satisfaction, how I view whether or not my life is successful, how I view all my relationships, all seen through the lens of whether or not I'm getting that thing. And so, James says, you desire, do not have, so you murder. When you can't get the thing, you explode externally and cause conflict for those around you. We'll deal with that word murder a little bit later. These are your ruling wants which have gone, gone unmet. Your ruling wants which have gone unmet. Have you ever been so consumed with the desire for something, it's just taken over your mind? I mean, I really, really, really want that. And and let's make make a distinction. There's those things that are sinful, just out and out sinful, right? Not fitting for a believer, not consistent with God's moral character. Uh, It's sinful. You just shouldn't want those things. Okay. But then there are those things that are legitimate. And you say, you know what, in a certain circumstance, that could be a very legitimate desire. Now, these ones are very deceptive because we can go far down the road of pursuit of that thing while justifying ourselves by saying, well, this is a legitimate thing. And so, but the question is, is it legitimate for you? Is it legitimate to the extent that you want it? Is it legitimate for you at this time? But we determine what we want and when we want it and how we want it. And we allow that thing to consume our hearts and minds. That then becomes an illegitimate desire or a ruling want. So I'm going to give you some ways that you can detect whether or not you have a ruling want in your life. James calls them passions that are at war within you. Here's how you can tell whether or not the desire you have is legitimate or illegitimate. Simply enough, does it consume you? 
Do you dwell on this thing constantly? That is, what is it in your downtime? When nothing else is engaging your mind, where does your mind go? You can't think nothing, right? Where does your mind go in the quiet time? You know when you're trying to read, and you read like three pages, and no idea what you read? Because your mind isn't on that, your mind's going somewhere else? What does your mind just tend to, it's like that vehicle that's alignment is off, and you let go of the wheel, and it just goes whatever direction. Where does your mind go? How is it oriented? Whatever that thing is, that topic that your mind drifts towards, is that which is consuming you. Because what's happening is, when you're not engaging your mind, it's what bubbles to the surface. That means it's that underlying, consistent passion that's always there. That whenever it has opportunity, it surfaces. What consumes you? What do you dwell on constantly? To what topic does your mind drift when it's undirected? What do you think about in your spare time? Here's one for you. What do you love to talk about? I mean, when you have opportunity, this is what I want to talk about. I mean, anytime I have opportunity. So much so that sometimes you, you so desire to talk about that thing that you begin to even change your social circle so that you can be around people to whom you can talk to about that thing. Right? And so here I found somebody that is an ear, and together I can talk about this. And this person uh, receives it well, and maybe they contribute to the conversation, and now I'm just fueling my passion and fueling my passion and fueling my passion. What do you love to talk about? What is the recurring theme in your conversation? I said that this is deceptive because as believers, we can take something that has become an illegitimate desire. And because in its purest form, it's legitimate. And so we can even take that thing and make it an element of our prayer lives. Lord, this would be good for me. This would be very good for me. I would serve you if I had this thing. I'd be so content, you know, like... Uh, the way to deal with covetousness, how do you do it? Well, you just get what you want. The covetousness goes away. We can pray about that thing and put a spiritual veneer upon it so it becomes a major subject of our prayer lives. We know that's true because what does James say in verse 3? You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So you've made this passion in your life, this ruling desire, even a matter of prayer. And so you're taking it to God and say, I really, really, really want this, God. Now listen, just as we can treat other people according to whether or not they enable us to get that thing or not, also we begin to see God through the lens of whatever that idol of our heart is. And so we pray for something. And here's the danger. God doesn't give us what we want. Do you allow the deprivation of that thing to then affect the way that you see God? Bitterness then develops towards God or anger or resentment towards God because He's not giving you that thing that you're determined is the key to your happiness and joy? James says, hey, you're even asking for this thing. But you're not, you don't receive it because you're asking wrong. You just want to spend it upon your passion. You want to indulge yourself. So what has captivated your love? What has become the primary object of your wants? What are you presently in the pursuit of? And what have you placed your hopes? What has become at one point a nice desire? Has become now elevated to a position of need. I mean, I need that. If I don't get that, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, here's another class of questions for you. When are you fearful or discouraged and upset? Or, I'm sorry to say it this way. This, by the way, is a wonderful way to detect addictions. When you are fearful and discouraged and upset, where do you turn? When you are fearful, discouraged, and upset, where do you turn? I'm going to add another one. When you are fearful, discouraged, upset, or lonely... Where do you turn? 
Why did I say that's a good way to detect addictions? Because fear and discouragement and uh, being upset or being lonely, all of those things create a void in your life. Something missing. We find something to fill the void. We find something to assuage our fear. We try to find something just to lift our spirits. We try to find some, some vestige of intimacy to help me not feel lonely anymore. Where do you turn when you're fearful, discouraged, upset, or lonely? Next question. What are you trusting in? What is your source of security? As long as I have this, I'll be okay. Right? I mean, I can lose so much in life, but as long as I have this, everything's up. That's the source of your trust. Next question. What do you fear, what do you fear occurring? I mean, what is the source of anxiety? If this ever happens, I don't know what I would ever do. You can see that every single one of these questions, we, we can answer, we, we can take the concept of God in Christ, and we can offer God in Christ as the only object, rightful object, of each and every one of these questions. So what topic does your mind drift to when it's undirected? The believer who's living a vibrant Christian life has a spirit of prayer in them all the time, never ceasing to pray. Your mind is upon God. Where does your mind drift? Well, a a spiritually growing person, oftentimes that mind that's unengaged will drift to spiritual things. What do you think about in your spare time? How about you when you're driving? What do you do in your spare time? Do you whisper prayers for the people around you? Do you pray for people in your church? Do you pray about circumstances in your life? What do you love to talk about? Does your love for Christ overflow in your life? Or is this it's a topic of conversation everywhere you go? What is a recurring theme in your conversations? How about your prayer life? Is it overtaken with passions and desires, or is your prayer life one which magnifies Christ? I mean, this is how depraved we are that even our prayer life becomes self-centered. Next question. Whatever this thing is, this passion in your life to determine whether or not it's a ruling want, are you willing to compromise too much to get it? Are you willing to compromise too much to get it? Willing to compromise holiness in order to get it? Are you willing to compromise the pursuit of spiritual excellence to get it? I mean, there's a time in your life where you say, you know what, I want to be a vibrant, growing believer who's pursuing excellence. But this desire comes in and you say, well, you know what, I can kind of shave off this pursuit and I can kind of lower my standards here and lower my standards there. And if I do those things, now I believe that uh, um, I can settle for this thing. Or I can attain this thing without compromising holiness or excellence or other friendships or relationships or personal integrity or truth. You got to compromise to get that thing? That means you've elevated whatever it is you're compromising to get that thing, you've elevated that thing over everything you're compromising. Are you willing to compromise too much to get it? If immediately when you want something, you begin to think about what you're going to have to throw overboard in order to get it or to keep it, there's a problem. Are you likely to sin when you don't get it? This is what James is talking about. You desire and do not have, so you murder. Is there something that you want, but you don't get it? And if you don't get it, you're going to sin. Maybe you're going to sin by going an illegitimate route in order to attain it. Maybe you're going to sin by having a spirit of discontentment or anger or depression or fear because you didn't get it. Will you be likely to sin if your desire is not fulfilled? And closely related to that, I already touched on it. Are you willing to sin to get it? Are you likely to sin when you don't get it? Are you willing to sin to get it? It's a clear sign this thing's become an idol. A willingness to sweep aside your pursuit of God and His holiness in order to attain something. And so these are heart causes of conflict around us. Entrenched battling desires of the heart, unmet ruling wants and desires, 
And then James goes on in verse 2 to talk about coveting and envy. You desire, do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. So you covet and cannot attain, obtain. Covetousness, the Bible equates with idolatry. Ephesians 5.5. 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Covetousness is idolatry. Just, just, there's not even any degrees there. I mean, if you're coveting that thing, it's, it's an idol in your life. That's what Paul says in Ephesians. When we allow our wants and desires to be elevated to positions as objects of covetousness, we are, in fact, erecting an idol in our lives. It's a dangerous place to be. An idol competes for our love and our affection and our devotion and worship that's due only to God. Covetousness. What is covetousness? It's, it's looking at things, desiring those things which do not rightfully belong to us or which God does not have for us. Oftentimes it's looking at what others have, and when we covet what other people have, then that becomes envy. So there's envy and there's quarreling amongst us. Why? Because we're coveting. In verse 3, he goes on and says, You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it upon your lust. And I've already stated this, that we are so depraved that uh, we erect these idols and we wrap it up in a spiritual garb and then we even bring it to God and pray for it. So, so here's the thing. Let's not deceive ourselves by thinking that just because we can pray for something, that then that must be legitimate. Because what James is saying is, no, you are praying for things, you're not receiving it, because you're not asking, your selfish desires, it's an inordinate desire, this is elevated to the place it shouldn't be, you're not getting it, but you felt fine about praying for it. And so let's not fool ourselves into thinking that because I can pray for this thing, uh, it's legitimate. We're experts at wrapping our sinful or unhelpful desires in spiritual garb. We're even able to pray for those things which have replaced... We, we pray to God for the thing that we have actually replaced God with. The Lord's prayer is selfless. The model prayer focuses upon God, a worship of God and a provision of our basic needs. It's very selfless. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You, 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 you. It's about God. You elevate him and his will. And then give me what? Just my daily provision. My, my physical provision, my spiritual provision, so forgive me for my sin, provide my daily bread, and so on. Don't lead me into temptation. It's selfless, and it's God-centered, and we can get to the point where we've erected idols in our lives, so even our prayer lives become corrupted. The sinful heart seeks to please itself more than to please God. It craves its own kingdom and its own will, and therefore its prayer is corrupted. A desire can also be sinful when it's inordinate or selfish. It's possible to desire a good or legitimate object too much. That's what we're talking about, elevating it to a wrong position. So, what James 4, 1 through 3 teaches is that conflict comes from the sinful desires that are in our hearts. This is the internal conflict that we have. And so Hebrews says, understand there's an internal conflict, understand there's something that's captivated you, lay it aside. You have to lay it aside. If you're going to run the race, you run the race, you set the path, you encourage others, you try to be support for them, you make the path clear for them, you don't be an obstacle to them, uh, you strive to maintain peace with them, and if you're going to have peace, you've got to avoid conflict, you're going to avoid conflict, you can't have idols that are at war in your life. And so let's deal with this idea of murder, because some of us, I think we use that word to say, oh, this is not talking about me, because this is talking about extreme situations here because it says you desire and do not have so you murder you're like well I don't murder I don't want to murder anybody I don't know any murderers so this must be talking about a different class of people but that's not the case first and foremost mankind does have the potential 
to murder simply as a means to attain what he wants, right? And so, so mankind is definitely capable of, in the pursuit of passions, murdering. So let's just say that. You think about uh, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You have the, a whole city of people that surround. Why? Because they were consumed with their passions, and consumed with their passions they desired, and uh, they are willing to harm and even to murder But we can also be guilty of this. Jesus says in 1 John 3.15, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. You know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. What is Jesus saying? He's taking it to his logical end. He's taking it to his logical end. We're content with hatred, and we can say... You know, we, we can hate people, but Jesus is saying the same spirit behind hate is the spirit behind murder. And so he takes it to his logical end. He wants us to understand the severity of something like hate. James, giving us ethical implications based upon the oral teachings of Jesus, is using similar language. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. I mean, I want to do whatever I have to do to get that thing. That's how much it's consumed me. The same spirit that would... Kill somebody for that thing is the spirit that's driving you because you're willing to do anything and everything you can just to get that desire of your heart. That's the idea. Well, this is a problem in conclusion because verse 4, this goes right to the heart of our relationship with God. And James is putting this in the context of idols. And how do we know this? Because he says, you adulterous people. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Saying you're adulterous people because you are being uh, unfaithful to your relationship with God as your primary love relationship, and you've set something else up in your life that is consuming you. So you've been unfaithful. This can create hostility against God. He says, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You've set yourself in opposition to God because you're worshiping another idol. When we take a legitimate desire and we elevate it to a position of idol it has a potential to create hostility in us against God it also causes in us a disregard for scripture it says here in our passage in verse 5 do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us hey let's look at the plain reading of scripture the bible says that he wants you to love him above everything else, and he's jealous over you, and you've completely disregarded that as you pursued your idol. And so, the potential to be hostile towards God, and you're disregarding the plain teaching of Scripture, and listen, when a desire consumes you, you're willing to trample over a whole lot of stuff in the pursuit of that thing. Even the plain reading of Scripture. And really, at the source of all this is personal pride. Verse 6, but he gives grace, gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You're caught up in your pride because it's all about you. This is what I want. At the expense of relationships, at the expense of peace, at the expense of running the faithful Christian life, this is what I want. I want it now. I've determined that this is God's will for me, regardless of what God says. And if you go on later on the passage, it talks about that type of presumption. Hey, this is what I'm going to do today and tomorrow and so on. And James says, no, you should be saying, if it's God's will, I'll be doing this. It ought to be a submission to God's will uh, whenever we are pursuing something. So whatever it is we're pursuing, we're holding on with a loose grip. God, if you want this for me, if it would be good for me, being subject to your desire and your will for me, then grant it to me. There's nothing wrong to desire. There's nothing wrong uh, to want. There's nothing wrong to desire. But you bring it to God with an open hand and say, if it be your will, then do this. And the the sign that this then has become an illegitimate desire is it begins to consume you. To crowd out those things that are good and right becomes your, your driving passion. I don't care what it is in our lives, no matter how big it is, or, or no matter how big the decision is, or, or how much we want the thing. You always hold it with a loose grip. You bring it to God in such a way where he can snatch that thing out of your hand and say no. And when he does, or if he does, there'll be no hostility towards God. There'll be no bitterness towards God. Uh, You're not going to become despondent and depressed because you don't get that thing because you're holding it with a loose grip the whole time. And so like Jesus, nevertheless, your will be done. I'm going to read you a quote 
in closing by David Paulison, his book, Speaking Truth in Love. It says, We human beings most fiercely resist seeing ourselves as God sees us because we fiercely resist seeing God as He is. We don't want someone else to get the final say, and we don't want to admit it. We don't want to need someone else to rescue us from ourselves. Compulsive unbelief and self-will are more ominous and more interpersonal than the psychological kinks of other theories. In other words, what he's saying is we don't want to admit that really the source of our main problem is compulsive unbelief and self-will. We're not trusting God and I'm elevating myself and my desires above everything else. We don't want to believe that's our source problem is what he's saying. Compulsive unbelief and self-will are more ominous and more interpersonal than the psychological kinks of other theories. We compulsively rebel against the person to whom we owe our lives. Our psychological kinks are wrongs done against the person we are created to love. We are not first psychologically false. We are first interpersonally false, covenantally false, religiously false. We play false to ourselves because we play false to God and don't want to face up to it. In other words, we sin. We don't want to know this. It's easier to admit sexual perversity. Death wish, power drives, egotism, neediness, or class consciousness than to admit sinfulness in the sight of God. Bad as they are, those other things are not the devastating blow that unglues us this does. Saying it's very easy for us to classify and categorize and label our ills. I have a problem with, with sexual addiction. I have a problem with uh, power drives, egotism, neediness, class consciousness. And all of this what we're doing is we're failing to call it what it is. It's sinful self-indulgence which is violating or offending the holy God with whom we have entered a covenant love relationship. It's simply rebellion. It's sin. It's unfaithfulness towards God. We want to take it outside of the realm of the interpersonal and, and make it into something else. So what do we need to do? We need to go back to James. James says, you adulterous people. He just hits it right on the nose. That's what it's all about. The adulterers. And so we need to be quick to say, I am an idolater at heart. When I pursue an idol, what I'm doing is giving love to that thing that I owe to God. I'm violating my relationship with Him. I'm being unfaithful. Like an adulterous woman or an adulterous man, I'm being unfaithful to God. I am a rebel. That's what we say. I realize that that's the product of the passions that are inside of me. And I need to put those things down so that I can live the victorious Christian life, run the race of endurance, that faith that endures so that I can bring others along with me. And so I'm going to strengthen myself. I'm going to strive for peace and holiness. And then what am I going to do? We're going to see next time. I'm going to see to it that others as well don't fall into the trap so that no root of bitterness springs up, which then can defile many. Well, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for who you are. I pray, we just thank you for the clarity of your word, Lord, that it's piercing. It reveals our hearts. It lays us bare. It hurts. But Lord, we appreciate it, and we love it, and we thank you that you've given us your word that can expose our hearts so that you can mold us and shape us in a way that glorifies you. I pray you'd reveal in us those passions that have consumed us. All of us have something in our lives that has taken a too prominent a position that's governing our thoughts and our affections. It's driving our attitudes. It's caused us to make bad decisions. It's caused us to hurt relationships. It's um, uh, stolen worship and love that belongs to you and you alone. Um, it's cause us to be discontent with your will for us because we are determined that we want to need this thing so we're discontent with your provision in the absence of it so forgive us for this reveal our hearts to us 
Help us to be fully satisfied in Christ, to understand whatever it is that we go to when we're fearful, when we're lonely, when we're upset, when we're discouraged, when we're depressed. That's the thing that we have replaced Christ with. You want us to learn to find full satisfaction in you. You want us to find full affirmation, fulfillment, and meaning in Christ, but we find it in other things. So I pray you'd reveal this to us. I pray that our desires would be pure, that all of our desires would maintain legitimate positions in our lives that would not arise to becoming illegitimate desires or, or legitimate desires taking an illegitimate position. So help us keep everything in the proper place with you and your will for us exalted as supreme over all. And Lord, we thank you that you have provided everything for us so that we can have lives of godliness. Thank you for all that you've given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us be content in him. Lord, I pray that you would help us to look internally to our own hearts so that we can kind of see how the word of God connects with the idols that we have established in our hearts, how your word can speak to those struggles that we have that cause us to uh, resort to those idols. Pray you just give us wisdom. Give us both an understanding of our own hearts and an understanding of your word so that we can see how your word speaks to our hearts. Lord, we thank you for this. We believe that our faith endures, that it's a faith that perseveres, that it's a faith that can provide victory over sin in the world. Uh, so help us to pursue it that way. Um, to not fall into a rut, to become entangled uh, with sin that prevents us from pursuing you. Lord, we thank you for this. If there's anybody here this morning that's not a believer, I pray that they would uh, lay down the idols in their own lives and that they would accept Christ as the one and only, as the only Savior and only Lord, giving their lives to him to pursue him above all others. Lord, we thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.